All right, we're going to be in Acts chapter 27 in our Bibles. We are almost done with the book of Acts. Is that awesome or what? We have one more chapter, which I will finish next week, and we will finish the book of Acts. And what an accomplishment, what a thing to reflect on, and uh, just super stoked that we're able to work through books together. I want you to know the Word of God. I want you to have it in your heart. I want you to understand it and be able to teach it yourselves to your your spouse, to your children, to your grandchildren. Uh, it is very important you know and understand the Word of God. Um, title of the message today is Sailing to Heaven. Sailing to Heaven. Yeah, on a boat. Sailing to Heaven. I heard of a story one day. Three men were hiking and unexpected, unexpectedly a large raging storm shows up. And before them was a violent river they had to cross on their hike. The storm is raging. The river is rushing. And they needed to get to the other side. They had no idea how to do so. So the first man, he prays to God saying, Lord, please give me the strength to cross the river. And poof, God gave him big arms and strong legs so that he was able to swim across the river in about two hours, but only after almost drowning a couple times. But he made it. Seeing this, the second man prayed to God, Lord, please give me strength and tools to cross the river. And poof, God gave him a rowboat and he was able to row across the river in about an hour, but only after it almost capsized the boat a couple times. Well, third man, he see all this work that the other two had to go through, so he prays to God saying, Lord, please give me strength and the tools and the intelligence to cross the river. And poof, God turned him into a woman. She looked at the map, hiked up the stream a couple hundred yards, and walked across the bridge. <laughs> Hear that? No guys are laughing. They're like, mah, 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 mah. it's actually on our way to the church this morning. So it's rah, 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 rah. Sailing to heaven. We as Christians are on a journey through life, aren't we? Desiring to walk with our God, love people that God brings into our path and show them the path of God. We enjoy life and work hard to build the kingdom of God above our own. This journey is like a voyage on a ship through many waters of life. Some days it's sunny out, huh? Water's perfect temp, birds in the sky, everything is awesome, beautiful. In other days, the storms show up. They knock the boat off course, moving everything around, messing up everything, tossing the boat th to and fro. Seasickness shows up. Man, the voyage of life is not easy, is it? But we are sailing to heaven. The horizon of heaven is our destiny. That is the shore we are looking for. And family, it's not far away. We're almost there. We've been sailing for a while. But really, how long is life? compared to eternity. How long do we really have on this earth? Why do we hear older people always say, man, life goes by so fast. Remember, I was just this age, I was just doing this, and man, all of a sudden, it's just, what happened? Everything's gone. And we're just in a new season of life. And we as Christians enjoy life, like I said, loving God, loving people, and inviting people to know God. That is our mission, that's our goal. We're sailing through life. That's what we'll see in our text today. Paul is on a ship. He's caught in a storm and a ton of bad things happen. But God sustains them, carrying them through the torturous storm. And Paul is calm as he's sailing on this boat in his life. He's a prisoner on the boat. And he's the calmest one there. Everybody else is freaking out, wondering what to do. And Paul is cool as a cucumber. How does this happen? We will see why. Last week we looked at Paul being mad for God, not angry, but a little insane, a little crazy, a little off his rocker, a little fervent and enthusiastic about seeking and building God's kingdom, mad for God. Remember, he stood before Festus, the, the governor, and then King Agrippa, and they're like pressing him with questions, what's going on here? And he's like, look, I'm telling you the truth. They're like, you're insane. You are mad. And he's kind of like, well, I'm definitely not mad. I'm telling you the truth. But we see Paul was a little mad for God simply because he told the truth. Simply because he tried to build God's kingdom. He was mad enough to try to persuade King Agrippa. Do you remember that? To be a Christian. 
he was a little mad. And I encouraged us as a team, as a family, as a group, we kind of need to step it up on our mad level. We're a little conservative when it comes to being radical for God. We're a little scared what the people think, what people are, are going to view us and what they're going to think of us. And I'm telling you, we need a little of that in our lives, being mad for God. We are in Acts chapter 27, and we will conquer this chapter today. Would you stand for the reading of God's word as we read our first part of this text? Why do we stand? We are giving reverence to Almighty God as we open his word. We're recognizing that this is God's word on paper, and that it is inspired, and that it somehow supernaturally speaks to our lives. I don't have supernatural powers to be able to figure out where everybody's at in their life and speak to your situation. Pastor, were you reading my mail? Were you talking about us on the pulpit? No. I was just preaching God's word. It has the power to impact everyone's life. Let's look at the text. Acts chapter 27, starting in verse 1, it says, And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan court named Julius. And embarking in a ship of the Adramatium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, Macedonian from Thessalonica. Verse 3, then the next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for, and putting out to sea from there we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us, and when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Sicilia and uh, Pamphylia, Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on it. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty on Sindus. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete and off uh, Salmon. Coast, uh, coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which the city of Lacy. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was over already, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than what Paul said. And because uh, the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. You can be seated. The book of Acts, remember, is written by Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke is penning the history of the early church. I call it kingdom living. Jesus taught the disciples how to live on earth the way that it is in heaven. What, it, what does it feel like to live on earth as it is in heaven? That's the way Jesus lived. And that's the way God intends for all of us to live. Human beings are living wrongly, running around the earth, messing everything up. God says, let me show you how to live the way I created you to live. And that's what it means to love God and love people. Kingdom living, I call it. The disciples are going through this land, that territory, those countries, spreading the gospel, living under the kingdom of God, building the church, showing us today how we should be living and what the church should look like. Paul has been put in prison for doing so. He got on three uh, missionary journeys, he got back from them, and he got persecuted greatly after all that he had done. It's really sad, and now he is in prison. He's a prisoner on the ship. Dr. Luke is with him, and they're writing down what's happening as they sail to Rome, Italy. It was decided that Paul would go to see Caesar. So they put him under the supervision of Julius. This is the centurion along with other prisoners. Again, Paul had two friends with him, Luke and Aristarchus. They set sail on the ship for Italy, Rome, and stopped in Sidon, and Julius, liking Paul, actually let him go and visit his friends while in town. If you were in prison on a ship, would the guard like you enough to let you go free to visit your friends, knowing that you're honest enough to come back? That was Paul. That was his witness, and we should have a witness like that 
in this world, shining, loving, and serving at all times. They get back on the boat and keep sailing, redirected by winds, and they stop in Myra and Lycia. And Julius, this is the, the guard over all of the ship and over Paul, um, finds a ship of Alexandria, which was a large Egyptian ship which carried grain, okay? Yes, grain that would make bread. It was about 140 feet long and 36 feet wide. It would be bigger than this gym. This gym is about 60 feet across and 90 feet back. But uh, if you do the dimensions there, 140 feet by 30, that is about, I mean, just as big or bigger than this gym. It was headed for Italy and they continued on it. As we'll see in the text, there were 276 men on this ship. They, they continue on to Italy. The ship was very sturdy, but it, its sail was, was more square-like. And those of you who know about sailing, this thing had one giant beam, and it was a square sail. And so it, it was a heavy boat, again, that was very solid, but it was not good for sailing into the wind. Uh, they had giant rows on both sides of the ship that the men would push to propel the ship forward. But it's good when the, when the waves are calm, when the storms aren't raging. When it starts to happen, this ship is going down. Paul, being a seasoned traveler, he'd taken three missionary journeys around the countries there in that area. He knew what was going on, and he knew that the winter season, the fall season, was a terrible time to travel. He calls it the fast time. Did you notice that in the text, the fast? What does that mean? That's Passover. It was Passover time, just being over, just past. And so it's fall, winter season, and they know storms are coming on the ocean. So he warns them to just settle in this place called Fair Havens until the season of wind and storms in the wintertime passes. But Julius did not listen to Paul he said because the majority of the people wanted to go to this place called Phoenix because it was a nicer place to spend the winter. And the owner of the boat and the captain of the ship is like, no, 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 no. We're not staying in this dump all winter. We're not staying in this small town all winter. We want to go party in Phoenix. So we're going to go dock there and that's where we're going to go. It was 40 miles away though and storms were coming, Paul knew. They didn't listen to Paul's advice. They get all the prisoners back on the ship. They load up on their way to Italy and they're about to head into a great storm thinking that they're not gonna hit a storm heading for Phoenix. Look at verse 13. Now when the south wind grew gently, blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the northeastern struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along, running under the lee of the small island called uh, Coda. We managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. When fearing that they would run along uh, aground on the uh, S uh, Sirtis, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Verse 21, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them saying, men, you should have listened to me and not set sail for Crete and incur this injury and loss now. Yet now I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you but only of the ship. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. Okay, so they don't listen to Paul. They set sail, and lo and behold, a storm shows up. They did everything they could to stabilize the ship, but it's not made to hit the wind head on. They, they hug the shore as best they can to stay away from the winds, you sailors know about this, but are scared of scraping the shallow waters. 
They begin to throw cargo overboard what's we that's weighing down the ship, probably a lot of the grain on this ship. And on the third day in this storm, they were so desperate, they threw their, they threw their tackle. What's their tackle? This is their ropes and uh, all their gear that would help with the sailing so that the boat wouldn't sink. The, the thing is being weighed down. They're like, we gotta, we gotta lighten this load. They're so desperate, they throw everything over. The storm seemed to have no sign of slowing down after many days, and all the men began to lose hope. Have you ever been out on the water when a storm shows up? Anyone? A couple guys, some ladies. Yeah, it's gnarly. Uh, we've been out fishing, we go down, we, we, we get on the, the boat and go down south to Mexico waters, there's huge fish down there, and uh, we've been a day and a half deep, uh, almost two days deep, and we just go through the night, and uh, then we wake up and we start trolling, you know, to catch fish, or we'll show up to a lily pad and throw the poles over the water, but you know when, when, the, when the overcast comes, and all of a sudden the swells start to build, it's like, okay, what's going on here? Hello, and all of a sudden it starts to pick up, and these waves are gnarly. I mean, a, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, middle of the ocean, you look 360 degrees around you, there is nothing in sight but water, and the waves start to churn. You're like, okay, what's going on? Give me a couple more dramamine here. You know, I mean, you're, you're popping those things, trying to make sure you don't get seasick, because that boat just starts to toss and turn. They were experienced this to the highest degree. I've never been out there when it starts raining and dumping and 40 foot swells coming over you. You know how big that is? Uh, that's about as tall as the ceiling here. Can you imagine a wave coming at you that big? Uh, we were just in Hawaii this last week and two hurricanes showed up, Ignacio and Jimenez. And so off the coast, it was too far for it to really hit us. But dude, it started sending, dude, and dudettes. It started sending, started sending waves like you wouldn't believe. We pulled up on the North Shore there, started watching these things, 20-foot waves pummeling through, unreal, peeling, and the wind's hitting it perfectly, holding these waves up, and they are hammering the beach. There's only a few guys out there because nobody's crazy enough to get in those waters. The Hawaiian waters pull so hard because it's out in the middle of the ocean. An island in the middle of the ocean. Can you imagine being a boat in the middle of the ocean? All these waters pulling around you, pulling and throwing. This is what they're experiencing. They are throwing everything overboard. Whatever they can find, it's going overboard. We gotta lighten the ship before it keeps tossing and we tip. They've got anchors in the waters trying to hold them and guide them down. It's crazy. Paul is the only beacon of light on the ship. Everybody's a pessimist on this boat. This thing's going down and we're all gonna die. There's a glimpse of light. Paul stands up and encourages them. They were starving. They had not eaten, probably all seasick to some degree from this violent storm. Paul tells them to take heart and says, no one is going to die. Who can say that? Man, I know there's 276 of you. No one will die. The dude over there laying on this, you know, like throwing up, I, oh, help, you know, like he thinks he's gonna, he's like, you're not gonna die either, man. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone will live. He says the ship will crash. The ship will crumble, but no one will die. Like, you're crazy, dude. You brought us out into the wilderness to die. They said to Moses, do not be afraid, Paul. The Lord said to him, an angel actually said to him, some commentators say that it might have been the Lord. You must stand before Caesar. Behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. See, they're not gonna die, the angel said. So take heart, men, Paul says to them. I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. He was established and immovable in his faith and it encouraged the men. Ooh, that's a sermon. Let's move on. Verse 27. When the 14th night had come, here they are, 14 days in storm. Can you imagine? As we were being driven across the Adriatic uh, Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and four, uh, found 20 fathoms. 
I'll tell you what a sounding is in a second. A little farther on, they looked, they took another sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern. And what? Look at the sailors did what? Prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the shoulders, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. They've been out to sea 14 days, but they were encouraged by Paul that the angel told them they would survive. They sensed that the shore was near and they wanted to start sounding. What's sounding? This has nothing to do with sound or music. They didn't start playing instruments on the ship and jamming out and no. They started sounding. This is where, this is a, a, an ancient way of measuring the depths of the water. They would take a rope and put a piece of lead on the end of it and throw it over to see how deep they were. When, it, when they felt it hit the bottom, they, they would measure the rope. It would, it's like a giant measuring tape and it would let them know how deep the waters were. So 20 fathoms deep and then they got closer 15 fathoms deep. And so they were finding out how close they were to the shore. They were nervous about scraping and so they tried to drop a little dinghy boat into the water. And you know what that is? The little life raft, brr, you know, you get into the little guy. Imagine being on one of those in the storm. They're, they're, they're desperate, man. They're like, put the little boat over shore. We're going over. They start to lower it down. They're trying to get the boat in the water. Paul, they, they've got the thing up on ropes and Paul says, no. The angel told me that everyone must stay on the ship. Anyone gets off this boat, we will all die. Everybody must stay on the ship. The ship will crash, but we will all survive. That is the promise given. We must trust God at his word. He tells them to do that. And what does the text say? Did you notice the last verse there, 32? It says, the soldiers cut away the ropes to the little dinghy. And it went off into the water. And there were their hopes and dreams gone. I love it. The soldiers listened to Paul. What a great picture. Cutting the ropes on the life raft of the world, being saved by the hand of God. What would you rather do? Listen to the world and use their raft and die? Or listen to God and watch the ship go down, but be saved and brought safely to shore? Church, don't listen to the world's counsel do not follow the ways of the world. I know it looks like it works. I know it looks like it may be happy and wonderful, but do not follow their counsel because you will die in the process. Let's lower the boat in the storm. This seems like the best thing to do. God says stay in the boat, stay in the boat, and you will be saved. Do not get outside and go in the waters. Cut the life raft of the world. Cut it off, cut it off, cut it off. And stay in the boat with God. It is better to be in the boat with God than in the world in a little dinghy in the middle of a storm. Even though it looks like it's going to take you to shore. It will not. Sin is pleasurable for a season. Then it destroys your whole life. Look at us. We're in the raft. Man, this is so great. Look at those idiots on the boat. We know what we're doing. Hey, this is fun. Hey, we're going to make it to shore. And a 40-foot wave swallows you and you're dead. Sin catches up with us, doesn't it? Psalm 1 Blessed is the man, 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 huh? Who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaves never wither. Whatever he does shall prosper, but check this out. For the ungodly, it is not so, but they're like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the godly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You want to listen to God's word or you want to listen to man's word? You want to listen to the Lord's commands? You want to listen to the world? It's up to you. You make the decision. Have you ever been there? I have. Say, I know I should do what the Lord wants me to do, but I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to follow my own path. I'm getting in the dinghy. You're going down. 
you're going down, the storm is coming. We must obey the word of the Lord alone. Sometimes we don't understand why, huh? But Lord, why? You ever see a child? Dad, why do I have to do that? Mom, I don't want to do that. Why do I have to do it? Listen to me. You're not doing that because you hate them. You're telling them what to do. Why? Because you love them. And you don't need to explain to them why they need to be obedient. Sometimes we can't see what God is doing. Maybe some of the older folk here in this room can tell us younger people and say, hey, listen. Let me tell you a little something. Look back, they look back on life and say, I didn't know why I should have done this thing, but I'm sure happy that I did because it saved me all this heartache. I was obedient to the Lord and it saved me. And maybe others would say, I messed up. I went that way and I shouldn't have. Listen to wisdom, listen to the Lord, stay on the boat. Let's move on. As the day was about to dawn, verse 33, Paul urged them to all take some food saying, today is the 14th day. They have you continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. I love this verse. This is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. For not a hair is to perish from your head of any of you. You'll get it later. You'll get it later. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. They were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing the wheat into the sea. They listened to Paul. He told them not even one hair on their head would be harmed. What a blessing. Every bold man says amen to that. And they would lose they would, they would lose no more. Paul prayed for the food on the boat. Isn't that awesome? The storm is raging and everything's messing up and he says, let's stop and give thanks. For what, Paul, this storm? Yes. God's gonna save us through it. He stops and he blesses the food, giving thanks to God for providing for them on the boat. Are you thankful for what God is doing even in your storm? Look around. Are we not blessed? We got air conditioning here, man. We are blessed people. Gosh, I, I said that earlier, we're spoiled, but man, you just don't realize it. You just don't realize it sometimes how blessed we really are. I'm telling you, in the middle of your storm, you need to stop sometimes and just give thanks. Thank you, God, for all that I do have, even though much has been taken from me, even though everything's messed up. I'm telling you, the great full man is great and full. Full of life, full of joy, great in life because they're grateful. Be grateful, be thankful for what God has given. The, the, the ship will wreck and our text will finish and close. Take a look, here it is, our final text. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. They're gonna to try to charge the shore. Verse 40, so they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, and at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind they made for the beach, but striking reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The word surf in the Bible, bam. Verse 42, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from, being, from carrying out their plan. He ordered those to, who could swim to jump overboard first, make it for land, and the rest on the planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. So they saw the shore close by. They thought they could try and run the boat ashore, but the reef stopped them. It got shallow, just as Paul said. The ship would be wrecked, but the men would be saved. The soldiers were scared that these 270 would get away, so they pulled out their swords, and they were going to kill all the men on the boat because they, they know it, that they would be tortured and put to death if they lost those, those people, if they got away. So they're like, all right, let's kill them all. But notice the centurion, the, the head guard over everyone and over Paul said, no, he liked Paul. He liked him because he saw Christ in him, I believe. 
And he said, no, I don't want Paul to die. He ordered all the soldiers, put your swords away. No one is being put to death. Everyone, all of you guys who can swim, jump overboard, start swimming to shore. The ship's going down, as Paul said. And the rest of you, when the surf pulls this thing to pieces, just grab a piece of wood and just float your way to shore, right? There's a couple guys like, I can't swim. He said, just grab a piece of wood and don't worry, you'll make it to shore. And it says all of them were brought safely. What an epic ship story. Would somebody do a short film on this one? This is perfect. What, a little five, eight minute film? Beautiful, perfect. Suspense, drama, chaos, and a safe landing. Jay, maybe you do this, the music for it. That'd be awesome. I love stuff like this. The Bible's boring, really? Have you read Acts 27? The most suspenseful, it even says the word suspense in the text. Sailing to heaven. We're on a ship sailing on the waters of life, looking for the shores of heaven. Number one, here it is, your application. Christ is the anchor to our boat, okay? The only reason Paul was okay in the storm was because he knew the Lord was with him. When you know that Jesus is with you on the boat, what do you gotta worry about? It's cool, it's gonna be okay. Your ship in life is being tossed to and fro right now. You're like, ah, what am I doing? Jesus is with you. Really? Yeah, he's with you. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. He is with you on the boat. Hebrews 6, 19, we have this sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our high priest and has made a way for us to be reconciled to God so that God will now be with us through everything in life. As a non-believer, you don't have God with you. You're running from God. You're the enemy of God. As a believer, you have God not only as friend, but your Father. What a blessing. Psalm 62, 5. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from Him in the, in the storm of life. Hebrews 13, 5. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Point number one. Point number two, God controls the wind and the water. God controls the wind and the water. Paul heard the angels say that he would make it to Rome, that he would make it to Italy. If the angel said it, if God says you're going to Italy, guess what? You better pack your bags, you're going to Italy. Am I gonna make it? Yes, God said so. He would stand before Caesar. He knew who was in control of the boat, the wind, the water, and the time. He trusted God at his word, Paul did. He trusted God because he knew who was in control of the storm. Do you believe that? Job chapter 28, verse 23 says, God alone understands the way to wisdom. He knows where it can be found, for he looks through the whole earth and sees everything under the heavens. Listen to what Job writes about the Lord. He decided how hard the winds should blow and how much rain should fall. He has made the laws for the rain and laid out a path for the lighting. God alone understands the way to wisdom. He knows where it can be found. He looks throughout the whole earth and sees everything under the heavens. It is the Lord who causes the wind and the rains. Job 5.10, he gives rain on the earth and sends water on the fields. Who does? God does. Job 26, 8, he wraps up the waters in his clouds and the cloud does not burst under them. He obscures the face of the full moon and spreads his cloud over it. You ever see a cloud over a full moon? That's the hand of God. Mark 4, we see Jesus controlling the winter. Verse 39, he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, he, he just said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus is on the boat, he's with you, and he controls the wind and the water. What do you have to worry when you're in the middle of the storm? You're like, Josh, I don't know. He controls the storms of life. He knows what's going on. He's not surprised by them. He can change the weather whenever he wants. Is he not God? Is he not the one in control? Is he not all powerful? And this actually brings us more rest. Really? How? 
Because the one whom the weather obeys, this is our father and dad. It's pretty cool. My dad controls the weather. My dad loves me. He's passionate about me and he's going to take care of me. We have nothing to fear when Jesus controls the wind and waters of life. The storm's raging, but Jesus is on board and he controls the wither. Don't be afraid, he would say to you today. Number three, be an encouragement to those on the boat. Because Paul had right perspective and knew God was with him, he knew the Lord was in control, he then was able to be an anchor and strength and light of encouragement for others. He comforts us, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Church, family, legacy, do you not know God? Is he not with you? Is he not carrying you through life? As you have been comforted by God, please, I beg and plead with you, would you give that to the world? Would you comfort the world, people here in LA, with the comfort that you have been given? Stop and pray for them. Stop and encourage them. Be an encouragement. The ship's going down. Everybody's like, oh no, what's happening? Don't worry, let me pray. Don't worry, God's in control. Don't worry, everything's gonna be all right. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. I hope that's not your habit. But encouraging one another all the more as the day draws near, the day that we enter into heaven, the day that we finish this race, let us encourage one another. A family loving and serving each other. Church, if you see somebody down going through something, put your arm around them. What? Put your arm around, yeah, why not? Give them a hug, tell them you love them, pray for them, encourage them. Can we not be the family of God? We need each other in the storm, don't we? Sometimes you're the strong one. You're just like, yeah, charge. You know, you're like Lieutenant Dan, right? You know, you're on the ship and you're like, let's go into the sea. And other times, you know, you're sitting over there scared on the shore and you need somebody to encourage you. We need each other, don't we? No one, there are no such thing as solo Christians. We need the church, we need the people of God. We need one another to pray and help each other, amen? Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Give somebody a good word this week, please. Number four, and we're done. Salvation comes through shipwreck. Salvation comes through shipwreck. These men would be saved through hardship having to trust in God instead of trusting in themselves. And this is how people come to salvation. Remember, they had to cut the life raft of the world and trust in God. They had to let go of all of their trust in themselves and say, God, I need you. I cannot do this. It is coming to a point where we can see we can't save ourselves. We need God to save us. Some people in the world like to say, ah, you Christians over there, that's cute. You need God as a crutch. Not only a crutch, but a whole hospital, my friend. And you need him too. Because there are people far greater than you on the earth who do far much more good than you on the earth and are still in great need of God. Why do we need him? Because we are made to be with him. We are his creation. It's the only way to live. It is walking with God. You can try on your own if you want to. You will destroy your life and the lives of those around you in sin. We gotta cut the ropes off the life raft and trust in God to save us. Whatever you're holding on to today, thinking it will save you, thinking it will bring you happiness and peace and joy, you need to cut it off. Cut it off. Cut the ropes. It's not gonna save you. Not money, not success, not a good time. Not any of those things will save you. Don't trust in those things. They will discourage you and bum you out like you wouldn't believe. Look at the wealthy man who has everything he could ever want. Why are you not happy? Because it doesn't bring happiness. It just pays bills. Psalm 118.8, the middle chapter of the entire Bible. 
It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Don't trust in yourself, trust in God. Many times God has to break a man or woman down before he can build them up. I've seen more times than not, people come to Jesus when they are broken and tapped out. Sometimes we see children who are happy and know they wanna love and serve God their whole life and they're saved and they do. But most of the time, people have to be crushed by their sin and see their great need for the great Savior, and that's how they come to know Christ. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifice you desire, God, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repented heart, O God. That's where we need to be today. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Isn't this an amazing picture? The only way they would be saved and brought to shore is if the boat crashed. They had to be fully dependent on God to be saved. I love this picture. In this journey of life, we need to help others get on this ship as well. 